Hello, sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. Uh, my friend joining me over here is my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer uh, savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. And look who else is joining us. Oh, legend in the house. Hello. Carly Lloyd, first so time. Late. So first time nice. live, first time live in first, studio, right? Yeah. We've had you on the Zoom over the years. Um, all right, listen, we're coming off of yet another uh, day of games. Uh, the round of 16 is over. But before we get into all of that, uh, and we will get, we'll get into all of that, let's just take a step back here, because this is your first time in studio with us. And while we worked with you in, um, in Qatar during the Men's World Cup, this is your first Women's World Cup, and I, I would say that this is your first World Cup working where you are 100% all in, okay? Would that be fair to say in Qatar, it was, you know, kind of you were dipping your foot in the water. I think you liked what you felt, uh, notwithstanding working with me. But you, you wanted some more, and now you are full in 100%. And you're getting your first healthy dose of what it's like to be on live television across America. Uh, are, you, are you enjoying it as much as you look? Um, or is it uh, something that you didn't think it was going to be? No, y you know, I, I think the... The beauty of life is opportunities. And I was hesitant to come into the space. It wasn't something that I was like, this is what I want to do when I'm done playing soccer. Um, the opportunity presented itself. I kind of pushed it off as long as I could. And then it was like, hey, why don't you just give this a, tr a try? Um, you know, and so my agent, Fox, and, and all that. So the deal was to go over to Qatar, maybe just go over for a couple weeks, yeah. not, not the whole six weeks, see if I like it. And so that's what I did. And so first couple segments, I just kind of popped in here and there. Uh, then I started to get the hang of it. And it's great when you work with great people. So you- And me. And, and me. Of course, yes, Lexi, exactly. Mossy behind the scenes. And, um, you know, set me up to, to really feel comfortable here and been loving it. My only criticism, I just wish you would speak your mind when it comes to the U.S. <laughs> women's national team. <laughs> I think uh, I've been hanging out with this no, guy too no, much, right? No, no, let's, no, let's, no. let's talk about it quick. Uh, because, look, you've, you've come in for criticism. I think, like I said, you've gotten a healthy dose of what it is like to give your opinion and give what I think is your honest opinion. And I, I, I will repeat what I said on air. Um, you, well, you didn't, you didn't apologize, but you certainly don't have anything to apologize for. As a matter of fact, you actually did the job the way it is intended to be done in an honest and forthright type of, uh, type of manner. And it was wonderful. And it translates, and people like it, and people are going to say good and bad things. That just kind of comes with the territory. Were you taken aback at all by the, the level of criticism? And you are still relatively new uh, from uh, your finishing off your career. Your, your friends and your colleagues uh, you're talking about here, was it uh, was a little different? Disconcerting or, or jolting in terms of especially the the national reaction to your comments. I think the biggest thing for me was how big of news it became mm -hmm. because we were just reacting a lot in the moment. Nothing was scripted. It was all came from my heart. Um, it's been sad to watch and sad to see kind of where the program's gone. It was my job to leave the program better than when I found it. And so when you kind of see the team going downhill. I take, you know, full responsibility and it, and it hurts me to the core because I poured my heart and soul out to that team for 17 years. So did all the women prior. Um, but it's no different than my career. I was always somebody who was pretty blunt, very honest, didn't care what people thought of me. Um, people are always going to say stuff about you no matter what. Um, and I just spoke from the heart. And I think the, the TV transition for me is not something that you know, I, the light goes on and I change my demeanor and turn into this different person. You know, what you see is what you're getting and I'm giving my honest assessment on it. And I think there's so many people in the world and in the women's soccer world that see what I see because of the messages that I've received and all the people thanking me, hey, thanks so much for speaking up. Everybody's seen it, but nobody's wanted to say what's going on. And so... It just well, came out. I mean, unfortunately, that's the world that we have kind of created, where a lot of people, I think, believe one thing but are just too scared to say it um, or too intimidated or just worried about the, the fallout. And I love the fact that you have a backbone. I love the fact that you're honest. And I love the fact that you know, even though you're going to take some crap, uh, crap out there from, uh, from people, you still uh, have the, uh, you know, like I said, the, uh, the, the 
uh, the ability to say it in an articulate way, uh, but in an honest way. And don't, uh, you know, don't change. Don't change. So keep doing that. Mossy, anything on this before we actually get into the soccer? No, no. It's just been great to watch her on TV. I think she's been the breakout star of this tournament. Absolutely. And uh, I look forward to more of it in the coming weeks. Okay, so let's get into the uh, the games here. As I said, we finished the round of 16. We just got off the uh, the set over there. Colombia won, Jamaica zero. Colombia continues to cruise through. I thought that they looked incredibly mature for a relatively inexperienced team in this part of a of a tournament. Um, I thought that they managed the clock well. They got the the goal that they needed and. Uh, you know, ultimately, I thought we were the better team uh, going through. Mossy, I'll let you, uh, let you start. Anything on this game? Well, Colombia was in the unusual position. You would have thought if they got to the knockout stage of this World Cup, anyone they faced, they would be the underdog, the Cinderella. But this game felt to me like they were the favorites and the team that had the obligation to be on the front foot and to win and that it would feel like more of a failure if they lost. Uh, so that sort of pressure is different for them. I thought they handled it relatively well. They were the better team. Their all-time leading scorer, Catalina Uzme, stepped up. She gets the goal. First goal Jamaica had conceded all tournament. Uh, and it was enough for Columbia to go through. So hats off to them. Great news for all their fans that have been having so much fun here uh, this summer. Anything on uh, Columbia? I thought they looked good. I think, uh, you know, very organized. I mean, I've, I've played against Columbia a number of times. And you can just see the, the growth of the game, the growth of, you know, how far Columbia has come. I mean, Uzme, you got Caicedo. Um, yeah, they... they to me, there was no question that they were going to beat Jamaica. And Jamaica, I mean, you know, sat back, hunkered in a little bit, but you got to score goals to win games. Yeah, and, and you know, so much focus on Bonnie Shaw, and, and I thought that uh, Colombia did a good job of pretty much shutting her down. And to be and to be fair, I think Jamaica did a good job of shutting down Caicedo. Uh, um, so you know, you got to make sure that the uh, the stars are are, are taken care of. Okay, uh, so thank you, Jamaica, for uh, what uh, what you did, but you're going to go home. And Colombia still is a, a wonderful story to be told on and off the field, and they continue on. Um, France 4, Morocco 0. This wasn't even a game as far as I'm concerned for France. This was a training type of exercise. They were all over them from the start. This is where the, uh, you know, the street ends for Morocco. Still also a wonderful story for what they did and what it meant uh, to that team, to that country, to that, uh, to that region. Um, are your thoughts, I'll start with you, David, uh, are your thoughts any different after seeing this game relative to France going forward? Absolutely. With each passing game, I've really? become more and more impressed with them. Remember, France beat Morocco in the semis of the Men's World Cup. They end their run here as well. But yeah, that opener against Jamaica feels like so long ago when it was nil-nil and they were so toothless and we came on and criticized them after that game. Since then, they've scored 12 in three matches. Uh, Diani has emerged as a golden boot contender, Les Sommer scoring goals. They have so many weapons now. And I find the coaching dynamic there fascinating, especially when you contrast it with Spain. Uh, in Spain's case, they backed the manager and the players ended up missing out as a result. While with France, uh, when the players weren't happy with Corinne Diacre, they got rid of her and brought in Hervé Renard on the eve of the tournament because, you know, she was trying to phase out some of these veterans like Les Sommer and they weren't happy about it. And Wendy Renard, ironically a veteran she wasn't trying to phase out, just didn't like what was going on. And so she threatened to not play at this World Cup. That was the final straw. They made the change. Every Renard comes in and all of a sudden he's pushing all the right buttons. So it's interesting how two different countries approached it differently when they had a clash between coach and player. And here they are both in the quarterfinals. Anything on France and Morocco? I would agree. I, I think, you know, in, in facing France a number of years, I mean, they've always been like technically tactically good they just you know in between the ears they haven't been able to kind of like make that jump further and further in the tournament so I think their form looks good their movement off the ball the way they're scoring goals um, and I think that Renard your favorite your favorite guy oh, um, love me some Renard <laughs> You should do the podcast with a with a couple. Of I know. I, so that's what I tell you. What if France gets to the final? Then I will. I will. I will don the the white shirt that I that I already have, as you will see coming up. Uh, and obviously, France have your male crush yes. and also your female crush. And my the left female back. Crush. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, just, uh, I just I love, her. I love her. Go ahead, say the name. Carchawi, yeah. <laughs> no, terrific player. No, that Brazil game. She was the best player on the field. She's uh, incredible. She is fantastic. She's incredible. I would draft her first sure. in any type of uh, situation like that. All right, before we get to uh, looking at the quarters, we'll do that at the end because I want to kind of circle back, especially because we have uh, we have Carly here and take a look at this uh, U.S. You know, give the, give the kind of post-mortem here on the State of the Union, especially with, uh, with Carly, about what's going on. But, um, you, you know, you, we were talking earlier about the criticism that comes and the, uh, the you know, the, uh, I guess the, um, the women's team would call it the noise out there. 
And while the women's team are, uh, you know, blocking out the noise, we can't block it out. It's just constantly there. So I, I woke up this morning and uh, people were not happy with uh, a tweet, you know, get in line. So I saw you trending. I was like, was oh. I? I was really? like, oh. Lexi Lawless trending. Oh, wow, boy. what happened now? Oh, yeah, whenever you have a go at a more accomplished player than you, people throw your comparatively weaker resume in your face. Yes. It's become common on Twitter, but exactly. CNN took it a step further. We think, we're not sure if this was oh. real or a spoof, but I did see this. It was a graphic that CNN purportedly put together <laughs> comparing your World Cup resume to Megan Rapinoe's. And I have to say, looking at this, her career is better than yours. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a whole lot of zeros on your side there. Uh, your thoughts? Okay, on we have to reiterate that we are not sure if this is actually uh, actually real. Although, if you're going to get lambasted by CNN or any or somebody claiming to be CNN, at least to use a good picture, and they did. I mean, where was that picture from? Right. I mean, listen, uh, it's pretty nice, you know. And uh, I had the I had the. Uh, Renard type of thing going on with the two buttons mm -hmm. down and stuff like that. So I, I I looked good. But yes, if you were to compare my World Cup experience with Megan Rapino, I would certainly come up short, as would many, many players uh, going forward. So, you know. A couple things on yes. this. I don't know if you saw it because it was only up there for a second, but there was a topic bar that said Trump and others blame <laughs> wokeness for U.S. elimination. Right. And by putting your picture up there, it implies that you were one of those others. I want to defend you for a second. At no point did you ever say that on the air, that the U.S. women got knocked out because of wokeness. No, no. So that's putting words none in your mouth. None of us are saying yeah, that. Yeah, none of, no, nobody's but saying that. But if, if it's true, then it, it's CNN, so that's par for the course. Um, the, other, the other thing, one last thing before yes. I move on. You know, Carly has also been critical of the U.S. team. They could have done a Megan versus Carly <laughs> comparison, but then that would have blown up the narrative that it's only jealous, less accomplished players having a go at the U.S. women because Carly's resume stacks up pretty well with Megan. Pretty well, pretty well. She's done some things, Mossy. Yes. She's done some things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. Well, listen, okay, so we're going to, let's, before we get into the, uh, the candidates here from a U.S. women's national team perspective, I, I want to take it back to, you know, the, the beginning, almost like your, your birth of, um, being on television with, uh, with Fox. And when we were talking, um, and, I, I, you know, sometimes people don't realize that we have so little time on television. And the ability to say things is in these little, little tiny windows. And uh, we were on set, and you had said something about, and you could tell it was a, it was a personal, visceral thing that obviously had been building about this women's national team. And I, and I came back at you, and I still don't think that we ultimately got to it. Because when you criticize the national team, as much as I think it comes from an honest place, I also want to get to what you have seen. Because you, better than anybody, have experienced this team for a number of years on and off the field. And what it is and what it isn't. And the way that you see it right now. When you look at this team, especially in the cold, harsh light of day of going out in the round of 16, historically the worst finish of any women's national team in a World Cup. What are some of the things that you either see now or you saw when you were with the team that in that moment you said, this is not going to end well? Well, I think when I first got onto the team, there was just a level of respect for everybody there, for coaches, for other players, um, for support staff, you know, massages, trainers, doctors. And as the years have kind of gone by, it's, it's little stuff, but it kind of amounts to a big things and ultimately, you know, effects, effects on the field. But, you know, if you've got a massage, let's say, for example, you, your name's signed up on a certain time and you decide to not show up and you decide to not text the massage therapist or tell them, hey, I'm running a few minutes late. Um, and they're just sitting there and they have to just sit there and they have to kind of swallow that and not really say anything to the player that's done that. So, there's just things like that. It's like, you know, trash around the field. It's throwing your warm up and expecting the equipment guy. It's just, there's a level of, I guess, not everybody, but there's a level of just kind of the entitlement of everybody's going to do everything for you and just not being respectful of others. And I think that that starts at the top and that should be the coach and that should be the leader. And then it should funnel on down to the, the players. Well, I mean, you're talking about responsibility and respect, ultimately. And, and that, I think when, when people hear that, they can relate. Because, you know, look, you're, you're a legend and you have lived at an elite level from a sporting perspective for so long. And we try to get a glimpse into who you are as an athlete. But 
there are a lot of things that you're talking about that apply to life. And, and you know, we all deal with the, with, with the sporting world, but we also deal with the business world. And little things matter. You know, they say don't sweat the small stuff. And yes, there are things that you don't need to worry about. But there are little things that accumulate over time, and they can be detrimental to whatever that goal is. And so I'm glad that you, that you were able to give some real concrete details here rather than kind of talking an abstraction, uh, because I think it's important. And that's a wonderful example right, right there that kind of illustrates what I think is some of the frustration that you see. Because all of the stuff that you talk about, it comes from a good place, I think. And I don't want to speak for you. It comes from a good place. You want this team to do well. You want this team not only to live up to the past, but to do even better. But when you see things, and this isn't you grumpy old woman it or by any stretch of the imagination, but these little things, they do matter going forward. And so I'm, I'm glad that you uh, said that. Mossy, there's anything? A, there's a ton more. But that's all right. That's, it, again, it just, it, it, the respect. We want to let you sleep tonight. We, don't, you know, we yeah, can't go on. We, we could be here all night. I can't speak to the behind the scenes stuff, but one thing I've been thinking about lately is just overall talent pool depth. Watching France tonight, you know, they're minus Katoto, Delphine Cascarino, the Netherlands are without Vivian Miedema, England are without Beth Mead, Leah Williamson, Fran Kirby, they lost Kira Walsh for a couple of games. Spain, we know, the best player in the world, Alexia Potez, has been reduced to a bit player on their team because she's just coming back from an injury and all the players that <laughs> need to come team back. Not just gonna just and yet move. those teams are chugging along. While the U.S., you really felt the absences of Macario and Swanson and Mewis and Sauerbrunn. And so it makes me think that from a depth standpoint, there's something wrong there, that suddenly the U.S.'s talent pool, they're not pumping out as many players as some of these other countries that are able to replace the people that are missing at this tournament. We know injuries have been such a big theme at this World Cup. Uh, Carly, what do you think about that? Well, and, and what's scary is, you know, Ari talked about it tonight on air. The last time U-20s won a World Cup was 2012, and I believe that that was Sidney LaRue's group. Um, where is the rest of the players coming in? So not only is this a failure on the senior level, but this is trickling all the way down to the U, you know, 17s, U20s, hasn't been good enough. You see all these other countries, U20, um, Spain, Japan, been doing really well in the youth levels. And so, you know, we need to develop players. And so that's a fundamental problem that's going on within U.S. soccer and, and at the youth level. And I, I just think that you nailed it. I mean, you look on the bench, and maybe that's why Vlaka looked on his bench and said, hmm, I don't know who I'm going to put in. I mean, yes, there were a couple people to put on, but um, just from previous years, the the depth of, of talent and, and players that can come in and really make an impact is few and far between, I think. Well, Matt Crocker, I think that has to be his priority right now. He sorted out the Greg Berhalter situation with the men's side and Matt Crocker, the um, uh, the technical director now, the new technical director of U.S. soccer. I think that has to be his uh, his priority going forward. But this is a conversation also that has to do with something we've talked about a long time. Even in the green room the other day, we were talking about identity. And Mossy, we've talked about this plenty of times on our, on our show, establishing an identity. And it's all fine and well to talk about that. But whether it's the women's team or the men's team, at some point somebody has to come in and say, this is what we're going to do. This is the road that we are taking. This is how we are going to play. This is the type of player that we want. And in doing so, specifically to a, a, a country like the United States, with all of our incredible diversity that makes us one of the greatest countries in the world, it also provides incredible obstacles and challenges getting everybody to agree on one thing. And so whoever comes in next, um, because I think that Vlad Kondonovsky is, is going to go away, I think there's going to be somebody new. Whoever comes in next has to have a clear idea of what this team wants to do uh, going forward. And I say that because, uh, you know, our friend, uh, our friend um, Doug over there uh, at, uh, uh, at Fox Digital, what do we call it, Fox Digital? Doug McIntyre. Doug McIntyre over there at Fox Digital? Sure. I mean, whatever, okay, whatever. Uh, he put out a list of candidates in his latest article, and you should go read the article because he's a wonderful uh, writer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just read these to you, and I want to ask you about who you think uh, should be there. Uh, Sonia Bonpastor from Lyon, Jill Ellis from the San Diego Wave, uh, Tony Gustafson from Australia, uh, Laura Harvey from uh, O.L. Reign, Emma Hayes from Chelsea, Mark Parsons from the Washington Spirit, Oh, Hervé Renard from France, <laughs> Casey Stoney from the San Diego Wave, Pia Sunhagen from... Uh, Brazil, and Serena Wigman from, uh, from England. Any of those jump out to you? Is, if they're available, you have to have and do them? 
there's already some repeat customers there, so sure. I think that okay, this so that, needs to be clean slate. Okay. Like nobody. Um, I mean, hey, Renard, sure. Okay. Vigman, I think those are two of the two of the candidates. I mean, I must say this. Okay, Vlako and Donovsky's his first ever camp that he came in. It was a January camp, which is meant to be hard. You're coming off your off season. He came in and it was like double days. All right, we trained in the morning, came back out in the evening. That was the last time that there was actually a difficult, hard training camp that he had ever put on. You don't know, want to know why? Because some of the older players got sore, started pulling some muscles. So from that point on, he was influenced the entire time. So somebody that's going to come in or they're going to hire cannot be influenced by players. But what you're describing is the inmates running the asylum. You know? 100%. And, and, and look, I, I don't think you're naive in that you know that players do have power in club situations and national team situations, but that power balance is very is important. And exactly. as soon as you, you, know, you give them an inch, they're going to take a mile. Yeah. We, we've been players. We, under, we understand that. But, but what you're describing here is not sustainable, and ultimately you can't because immediately you lose face in front of any, uh, any players. And, but how quickly was that lost? You're saying one camp and that was it? His, his first, first January camp. They cut the double days. They, you know, they were all concerned with the loads and all this. And then ever since then, it, it become easy. But to your point, then this is what has to happen. Whoever comes in uh, has to clean house. Mm -hmm. And look, all of the, you know, the wonderful players that we talk about uh, that have been around and the Rapinos and Alex Morgan and the list goes on and on and on. They're gone. Wonderful so soldiers, wonderful uh, servants to the crest uh, and to the country, legends, champions. Uh, you know, fame, fortune, all that kind of stuff, that, that's wonderful, but their time is done. And to your point, whoever comes in now can start anew and start with people that you know, are, are younger, less experienced, and maybe haven't been, for lack of a better word, Carly, tainted by mm -hmm. what has come, uh, come in the past. And I think you have to do that and then use the Olympics next summer as a, almost a training camp for that next team that's going to come in and lead us back, hopefully, to the promised land. One name I'm curious about is Gustafsson, because I do think he's done a really nice job with Australia, without Sam Kerr for most of this tournament. Uh, and he was an assistant under Joe Ellis, won World Cups with the U.S. Uh, don't want to put you too much on the spot here, but, I mean, what do, you, what do you think of him as a coach generally? Would he be a viable candidate or not? No, no, no. He's, he's, okay. he's been, <laughs> he was there around 2012. He went away for a little bit, came back. No, I mean, it's still, it's still too close. It's, it, I don't know. Even if you get rid of some of those veteran players or they retire or whatnot, um, I just think it's yeah, it's. And you don't it's, want it's, anybody with baggage coming in. No, it's know? yeah, it's history, it's baggage, and you know I I think the thing is is when you're a young player coming into the national team, you're easily swayed, you easily follow certain leaders, and I think what's happened is there's been a a path that some of these players. Um, you know, have uh, I don't, I don't want to say manipulated, but maybe if they're being directed to go in a in a in a better way of you know what to focus on, what's more important, coming from a leader perspective, you know things things will be a little bit differently. But I think some of these you know some of these young players, the tainted, you know, they're they're being tainted with some other things, and it's really hard to go in there and just kind of be your own person and stay strong and you know not follow the crowd. My last question for you, Carly, about this before we go on to the, uh, the quarterfinals is, you know, I, I, I think I said this to you on air, not everybody is wired like Carly Lloyd. And that, that, that's what makes you great. And it's been wonderful to kind of get a peek into that mind uh, of yours and how you think about life and how you think about uh, the game. When, when your former teammates and friends and colleagues and to a certain extent players that you kind of grow up with when they hear you talk about these things in an incredibly honest and, you know, upfront and, uh, you know, uh, clear type of way, what do you think their reaction is? Do you think they're saying, yeah, but Carly did this, or yeah, but Carly doesn't understand this, or yeah, but that's the way Carly thinks, but I think about it, uh, about it this way. Can you look at yourself and say, um, you know, I... I recognize that this is the way that I things should be done, think should be done because that's what got you your success individually and as a team. But can you also see that there might be multiple ways to skin a cat? There might be other ways to be a champion, to be good, that don't involve the Carly Lloyd way? 
Yeah, I think that that was the beauty of our national team for so many years. That so many different players brought so many different things. Heather O'Reilly, you know, brought, you know, I don't know, the goofiness and the <laughs> uber intense moments of taking your shirt off when she's running the beep test. And, you know, Abby Wambach brought something different. And so, like, I guess I do have a difficult time when people don't treat their craft or their job a certain way because I'm like, I'm all or nothing. I want to be the best that I possibly can be. So I, I understand that not everybody is wired like that. But I also think that you can't have, you know, 11 of people wired like me out on the field. You need different, different personnel, different perspective. You know, Megan Rapino bring something different throughout the team, you know, a little loosey goosey, you know, having fun on the field. And you combine that with a Shannon Box, Abby Wamba, Cope Solo. I mean, we, you think about all of our different personalities, but we all have that one thing in common and that was to win. And so I think that that, that is also uh, really important for a coach is to be able to select players, not just based off their talent and you throw 11 talented players out there, but you've got to assemble a team that, can coexist with one another, and that's the most important thing. So I do believe that there are different personalities that can still help you win championships. So there's different ways to win, but to distill this down to its simplest form, you believe that this team lost track along the way in terms of what should be the priority and ultimately what gives them you know, all the attention and all, of, all the power that they have, which is winning? I think, yeah, I think that this, this train that this team's been on has been slowly derailing from 2015. We won the World Cup. Mm -hmm. Everybody's life was changed. Endorsement deals, sponsorship deals. And I think it's, you have to take advantage of it. I took advantage of it. So I'd, I'd be naive to say Nobody that I Nobody begrudges did. anybody yeah, taking it. I, I mean, I took ample advantage of it. Um, and so then 2019 comes. And then it starts to derail a, a lot more. And then 2023, here we are, and the whole train falls off the tracks. Um, and, and while I, I think that it's important to, 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 you know, take these opportunities, build your brand, but you can't lose sight of how you got there. You can't lose sight of what allows you to get all those things. Winning does that. You can't have the, all the other stuff and not win. And so I think that that's what has kind of happened with some of the players on the team is fame, money, spotlight, um, endorsement deals. All of that became more important than the art of winning. And that is why this team wasn't successful. And when you have a couple people not focusing on, on that sole winning, um, that's all it takes. It, it, you know, you don't, you don't need to have the entire team not focusing on winning. I, I know that I'm not questioning everybody on that team that wanted to win. They all wanted to win. I get that. But were they willing to do the things you needed to do to win, though? Exactly. And it's not all their fault. You know, look, Vlaco and is is not, um, you know, he, he's, he's got plenty of role to play in this in U.S. soccer as well. So the whole combination we talk about, you know, the, this, it just blew up, yeah. basically. Well, maybe it's a cautionary tale, ultimately, for the, uh, this next generation. Mm -hmm. no, my, my theory, which I said a couple of times in the pod, I'm curious to get your take on it, is that we, we talked about the blend of youth and experience, but it was almost two extremes. You had these veterans that have won so much that they didn't feel a sense of urgency anymore, and then you have these young kids that have other World Cups ahead of them, so they didn't feel that great a sense of urgency. There was nobody on this team that gave off a vibe to me that this World Cup was make or break a defining deal in their careers, and th that felt like a problem to me. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was just, a, and again, I can only comment on up to 2021. I have not been in there for the last couple of years. But um, when I retired, I mean, I, I didn't think that this team had good chances of winning a World Cup. And it's because of everything that I've been saying. It, it's just, that's not what championships do. They, they don't, you know, perform like the way they did. They, they, they haven't been performing well up until this point. It doesn't seem like they have a plan. It doesn't seem like there, there's any cohesiveness going on. And there was three years. Um, and, and we felt that in Tokyo in 2020, uh, 2021, where it just, we had all these players and, you know, we had line changes. It was like I would start one game, then Alex would start, then I would start. It was just a very interesting interesting time and so uh, yeah I, I just think that um, there's just been a, a lot that's kind of gone on and hopefully this is a reset you know we we look at uh, I think it was you know 
France, right? That did they win two men's men's World Cups that era? Uh, they were going. Well, they've won. They've won them in '98 and 2018. Yeah, there's uh, but they just went to the final, you know, twice. Went to the final in yeah. 2006. And, and so you know, kind of that that mentality of you know, you think you're kind of untouchable, and un you know, and we've seen this World Cup that. Anything yeah. can happen. Well, they're very touchable. Yeah. They're very touchable. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's check out the uh, quarterfinal set before we wrap it up here. Uh, Spain, Netherlands. Mossy, who you got? Spain, Netherlands. I'm going to go with Spain. Although, yeah, as you know, I'm enamored of that team. The way they. Play. Oh, I know. I, I know. think I kind of won my. Get orgasmic. I yes. get orgasmic. I think she's the best player at this tournament. 100%. I know that was my one controversial selection in my top ten goals list. I just felt like I had to get her in there. So I stuck it at number 10. Lame-ass like number 10 goal, like a, just a throwaway type of goal. The way they cut it, too. It didn't do justice to me. But, um, <laughs> I know. That, that, that wasn't a very great angle of that, no, that no. goal. But I, you, you will admit, after that, the other nine, you can quibble yes, with the order. Absolutely. But they were all For those that it. didn't watch, Mossy had his top 10 goals of the tournament here. And the last time we did it on air, there was a lot of controversy because evidently a lot of cooks <laughs> in the kitchen. But this one was all him. Joel Santos, Ben Grossman types got involved. This this time around, I made, made clear. Oh, wow. Mind. We're, we're calling people going. out, too, That's now. Right, yeah. I like it. He's I like an artist. It. Um, well, to go back to this game. So, uh, I, I think Spain is the better team. I think they're the most talented team in, the, in this tournament. I do question their championship medal a little bit. They might be this bully team that when you put an elite opponent in front of them, they find ways to lose. I keep thinking about that England match at the Euros where they played England off the park for 80 minutes but let England hang around, ended up losing. Um, so... I'm going to go with Spain, but it, I'm not confident about it. It would not shock me at all if the Dutch advanced there. Carly? I'm going to go with Spain okay. um, only because I picked them to win it all, and I picked Bomati to get uh, MVP or, you know, golden golden ball of the tournament. A um, couple things with Spain, though. I think they actually play better without Puteas, um, whether she's, you know, coming back with, with her injury or what's going on, but I think they actually – Play better without her in this version of Puteas. Or, yes, okay. in this version. Okay, so if she was 100, percent that then still maybe. Yeah, or I mean. Okay. It, you just well. So what I hear is you do not like Alexia Puteas. Well, that, that, no, you don't. That's put what words, I heard. That's what I, America. Don't think, put words in my mouth. I'm not putting any word. I think you just kind of said. It. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> All right. I think right now the form that she's in, I think the team seems to play better, and I like Jen, Jennifer Hermosa. You know, kind of back is like more of a false nine. So. Um, a little suspect on their defense, though. Still, uh, it's just it's a little shaky. I'm going to have to agree with all of you, and I and I and I I just I worry that sometimes they are so enamored with how to play as opposed to just getting it done. And this is you know a, a something that we've talked about with the men's team over the years too. Uh, and it is beautiful and wonderful to not to everybody, but just to to many people there. And so that's the only. I guess, Achilles heel, if there is, of this, uh, this Spanish team. But I'm going to pick Spain, too. All right. Japan, Sweden, Mossy? Japan. We've seen two different versions of this team. The one against Spain that had 23% possession, then the one against Norway that had over 60%. I think this is going to be more the Norway version. I think they're going to be the team on the front foot in this game. And ultimately, they're going to be successful. Sweden, who I was high on going into this World Cup, um, I think had been pretty underwhelming. They had no business advancing against the U.S., uh, so they, they were lucky there, but it's not going to happen twice. I think they go out here. Charlie? I'm going to go with Japan. Okay. I, I I feel like Japan could win this World Cup. I'm just going to throw that out there, like, pretty strongly. But, um, yeah, I, I would agree. Sweden has been pretty underwhelming. I, I was just talking to someone walking over to the uh, studio, and it's it's gone great for Japan. But that's all that has happened is that it's gone great for Japan. And so we have yet to see what they look like when they suffer. We have yet to see what they look like when they get punched in the face. To your point, they've already shown that they can show different sides and they can adjust uh, and they can they can be a possession based team and they can be a countering type of team, which is which is great. I just wonder what they look like when they're looking around and saying, oh, this isn't anything we planned for, and we're in trouble here. And as always with Sweden, set pieces a big yeah. factor yeah. in this mm -hmm. game. They have to defend those well. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to go with Sweden. There you go. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to go with Sweden. Uh, Australia, France. Mossy. This might be the toughest one to pick. Uh, I know I was singing the praises of France at the start of this pod, but I'm going to go with Australia. I think something's happening so here. There's something magic. It feels there's so magic. Ma huh? There's magic in the air. Um, so I think they're going to pull this out. I'm curious to see if Sam Kerr starts, if she's fit enough to play from the beginning. Uh, I, I would probably say no. I think they would bring her off the bench. Yeah, I, I don't again. think you can start no. with Sam Kerr. 
her. She's but not fit. She looked great the other day, and, but it was only 10, 15 minutes. But I, I just don't think you risk it. But the way other players have emerged, Haley Rasso, Kaylin Ford, Gorey in the midfield, Fowler, Catley at the back, um, I don't think they're that Sam Kerr dependent. I think, you know, she could come on if they need her, but they could win this game otherwise. Uh, France is probably the better team, but I'm, I'm picking this more based on okay, yeah. magic, atmosphere, the home crowd. Okay. I like that. I like that. I, I am going to say France, though. I, I don't think Australia is necessarily playing great football. It's just they've got a couple counterattacks and the individual players that you said, like the Gory, Ford, uh, Rasso, have been really stepping up. Uh, I do think that, you know, they do have a chance – with the home crowd, but I don't know. I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with France. I'm going with France too. Uh, I picked them to win, so I kind of have to go uh, go to with win them. the whole thing. Yeah. Oh wow. It's just because he likes his guy. Yeah, I got my guy and my girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go with France. Uh, I think this is where the Australian magic ends, but I am worried that the magic may be stronger than I anticipate because there was something special there the other night. We were. You know, I, I think I told the story yesterday. I, I lose track, but we were on set and we heard people just screaming as Sam Kerr. Just even the sight of her warming up on the sideline, and then she came in. Remind me of yeah. Remember, I was Beckham. at the game last night. You were working. So oh, that's working. right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you Sam got... entered, and I was like, wow, seventy-five thousand. Must people have been were. fun. Yeah, yeah. you fun. can tell me about it later. <laughs> my, my goodness. Uh, all right, final uh, matchup in the uh, in the uh, quarterfinals here: England versus Colombia. I think this will be tougher than you might expect, but England will go through it. I think that China game was an outlier for England, and it's going to be more of a struggle with the players they're missing, and, and they missed Lauren James for this game, suspended for that ridiculous stomp. So did, they, did we decide how many, how many they're going to give her? Or I have not games, seen. Right? Uh, I have not seen any word on that. So. All right. Well, but she's definitely out for this. Definitely game. out for this. Maybe, game. maybe even for the uh, next game because of that stupidity and craziness in that uh, in that moment. All right. So you're going to pick England. Yep. Early. I would agree. I think that this is going to be a tough, tough match for them. Um, but, you know, England, I feel like every game have had to adapt and adjust. You know, we've got Kira Walsh out one game. Tactically, they switch it up, 3-5-2. Um, now Lauren James. I just think sometimes when you have to, like, gut through a tournament like that, you know, it makes you dig deep. And we know so. you love the coach, Serena Vigna. She's you know? great. I mean, she is great. And she is. There's a lot of people that love her. And it should be wonderful for the U.S. team if, mm -hmm. she, if she were to be available or for, if she wanted to do that. But she's proven, to your point, time and time again, that she can adjust things individually, tactically, um, and even, you know, I guess motivationally to mm -hmm. produce results. So, all right. Um, I am... I've said before that I have this horrible feeling that England is going to win this tournament, and it's just going to it's going to kill me, Mossy. I don't think I can I can handle it. But in this particular matchup, I do have to go with England. And if I'm England, I I, I smell blood in the water. I, I with all these teams going out that they don't have to worry about, and there's still plenty of talent that certainly could beat this England team. I just feel like they. They feel like this is their moment, moment, and they squeaked through them in the last game on uh, on penalties. So yeah, I got England, uh, England going f uh, going forward. Uh, we are taking two days off, and then we come back with the quarterfinals on Saturday and uh, Sunday. Right? Is that the, is that how it works? Two games Saturday and two games. I'm oh, sorry, two games. Yeah, two games Saturday. For us here. Yes, for us here. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, yes. For people back home, but this is you know, this is going out all over the world. So here it's going to be Saturday and Sunday. Uh, actually. Friday and Saturday. Wait, what day is today? Yeah. Is today Tuesday? Tuesday. Ugh, Wednesday, Friday. Thursday, we're off. We're going to take two yeah. days off, and then Friday <laughs> and Saturday, we are going to have these, uh, these, four games, uh, these four games happen. Before we go, some rumors uh, regarding Neymar. And I know you wanted to talk about this, and, you know, it potentially, who, knew, who knows where he's going, but evidently he does not want to stay, and he is going to go someplace. Is this what's yeah, happening? Yeah, I'm getting a lot of tweets about this, so I wanted to acknowledge it on the pod. Woke up this morning to all these stories that uh, Neymar has asked to leave PSG uh, and everybody treating this like this is some bombshell new development. I thought it was a given that Neymar and PSG wanted to go their separate ways, but they're stuck with each other because no serious club is going to uh, absorb his salary. You know, a 31 year old injury prone player who gives off this vibe, but he doesn't even want to play anymore. Um, so, but now we come to find out that MLS is a possibility. Uh, I think this would be a disaster for his career <laughs> because, uh, like I said, to me, Neymar is not wired like Messi. Where Messi, any situation you drop him into, he's going to be a professional. He's going to take it seriously. He doesn't know any other way to be. With Neymar, the circumstances around him affect how he approaches uh, the game. And I just think 
like I said, he's already, to me, giving off a vibe as a guy that doesn't even want to play anymore. The only fighting chance for there to be some successful final act in his, his career is for him to go to some big club, go back to Barcelona or Premier League team, Manchester United, Chelsea, where he feels a certain pressure to su succeed at that club. If he goes somewhere where he feels like <coughs> he's doing them a favor by just being there, to me, that is a recipe for disaster. Uh, so, and, and to me, that's less a commentary on MLS than on Neymar, right, right. Uh, just the way he's wired. So the way th these stories hit me, I know a lot of MLS fans are excited. People are tweeting at me about it, but I don't know. To me, that, that would be an odd mix at this point in his career for him to but go But it's safe to say that Mr. Uh, Mr. Neymar is not wired like the great Carly Lloyd. <laughs> no. Okay. He would not. What a sad story. He said. would not uh, do well under the Carly Lloyd uh, regime and routine, I would, I would think, in terms of. No, no two no. days for Neymar. No. <laughs> no. I mean, look, Neymar and MLS, I'm here for it. It's, you know, it. I'm there, excited. There was even some crazy stories today about Mbappe. Did you see those? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, he wants to go to Real Madrid on a free in 2024. And PSG are telling him <laughs> that if you're going to leave, then we'd rather you leave now. So everybody's trying to figure out a way for him to bridge that gap for a year because Real Madrid don't want to pay money for a guy that they can get for free in a year. So that's where Saudi Arabia came in a couple weeks back. And now people are talking about MLS perhaps taking him on a loan for a year. I don't think there's anything to that, but that was like a story on Twitter for a couple hours. Everybody was buzzing about. Oh, so crazy times, huh? Crazy times. I haven't, even, times. I haven't even heard of any of this. <laughs> you know what I've only been hearing about? What's Women's that? World Cup. I know exactly. We're, I have we're, no idea what's going on in the world. In Listen, we're knee deep in it, and we still. All I know play. is uh, MLS Miami. Yes. Yes. So that, that's ex, been hard to miss. Yes. Uh, ex Barcelona. <laughs> That's right. There, there, there are, though, a lot of transfers involving Americans. I keep telling Sean Sullivan, one of these nights we got to get to that. Matt Turner on the move. Let's just get through Turner. this World Cup, and uh, you know, we will, we will continue to talk about different things. Uh, thank you, Carly. Thank you for yeah, coming sure. on and spending some time with us. I know days are long, and we do this at the end of the day, and it's a labor of love. We love to do it, and we have incredible crew that stays up with us, and we appreciate and uh, and thank you for staying up with us. And I want to just you know finish it off by again saying. What a privilege and a pleasure and an honor uh, it has been to work with you and to see how quickly you have absorbed everything, how great you have gotten on camera, um, and how quickly you learn. I think it's also partly the way that you are wired, wanting to you know, at least attempt to be the best and wanting to do the work. And I've been doing this a long time, and that is not always the case. So you're doing a great job. You're being honest, uh, as I said. Uh, you're being interesting. Uh, you're being personal. And all of that... Uh, is things uh, are things I think that resonate with the viewer out there, and Appreciate take it, it take it from me, take it from me, my friend. Um, if you do this long enough, you're going to have people <laughs> that like you and don't like you. People that say good things to you, people that say bad things to you, in front of you, behind your back, online, and uh, in letter form, whatever it ends, ends up being. It just comes with the territory. You got to have some thick skin, and you already have some incredibly thick skin. I oh, appreciate it. Any been... fun plans for the days off? I'm sorry. I don't know. Oh, you're good. You're, are you going to do anything in the next couple I'm, days? I think I'm going to golf tomorrow. Let's Ooh. do. And maybe. Oh, he's going to. Okay, you're going you're gonna to golf and you're going to do anything? I'm thinking about Bondi Beach. Oh, nice. Ah. I might go see a movie. I might go see that, uh, that, uh, that fun filled movie of yours. What was it? Barbie? The, uh, no. Oppenheimer. Uh, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer. <laughs> I'm excited to find out what Sean Sullivan and Aaron Schechter have planned because they've been. Talking. Partying like crazy. <laughs> right? Yeah. Maybe they're just going to rest, you know? I, I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt it. All right, listen. Uh, we've gone on too long anyway. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for writing and reviewing and subscribing and rating and downloading to all the different things that you do out there on all the different platforms. Thanks again to my good friend uh, and colleague and superstar and legend Carly Lloyd for joining us here. There she is, ladies and gentlemen. There she is, America. She graced us with her presence, and she brought it because I was giving her crap before. I said, you better bring it because this is the State of the Union, and we don't take any crap out there. And she didn't. She, uh, she brought it. It was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Well, uh, we will talk to you again in a few days so just give us a little break we're just going to take a, a little step away but we'll be back with all sorts of world cup and other stuff uh, for you we we'll continue on here uh, from sydney australia home of the world cup along with uh, new zealand over there until then and as always my friends size the day